Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Shane Murphy. I'm part of the uh, sales and marketing and uh, design team at Ashgrove. I'm a technical and sales director. Um, I'd say right from the get-go here, uh, you can see there on the bottom of your screen, you should see a little Q&A um, button. If you have any questions, will you just type them into that? I will answer them either as I'm going through the presentation or I will answer it at the end um, if it isn't relevant at the time that I see it. So um, let me know as well if there's any noise or sound issue. I think it should be okay. My little uh, mic here is telling me that the sound is open. So <clears throat> today we're covering solar. Um, two seconds. So we're going to cover the basics of solar. We're going to cover a little bit about costs and how we calculate payback. We'll talk about maybe uh, the grants and the criteria. We'll talk about uh, how we design it for any particular house or project. Today we're going to be discussing housing in particular, as opposed to commercial or industrial or agricultural. We'll talk a little bit about inverters and the batteries, types, etc. And a little bit then about how it attaches to a roof. Or I have some examples as well of how it might be ground mounted. So, tiny bit of background. Ashgrove, <clears throat> Ashgrove are around since 2001, um, and we've been in renewable energy since then. Um, we've been working with Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland since uh, 2006. We've about 15, it's probably 16,000 systems now around Ireland and the UK. Um, I need to change that figure. Um, but in 2022, we did about 1,400 systems. As I say, questions, drop them into that little Q&A thing. Tiny bit about SAAI. <clears throat> SAI, of course, are incentivizing all of this stuff. We'll talk about the grants in a second. But, uh, you know, they're incentivizing either through incentives or regulation. In the retrofit scenario, it's all about incentives. They will pay you or assist you in uh, retrofitting this stuff. If it's a new house, they kind of stipulate that you need to have low carbon technologies, um, which would include obviously solar panels. Today it's mainly about retrofit. Um, we'll skip that. <clears throat> we know that uh, I suppose as a country, we have about 500,000 houses to be upgraded between now and 2030. And uh, that's a big ask. Um, uh, so to be fair to SEI, the grants, have gone up over the last few years, except for solar, believe it or not, came down 600 last year. And the reason for that was, as of last year, uh, you were able to sell any surplus electricity back to the grid and get paid for it. Up until that, you weren't allowed to do it. Um, and so therefore, um, the grant that we're giving you last year was um, 600 euro more. That was to go towards paying for a battery so that you could store that electricity and use it at a later date or later time rather than exporting it. But that's after changing. So we don't like it, but we can at least understand it. So three different types of solar panels. Uh, the first one is what we typically see up on the roof today. You see it there in the bottom corner. Um, you know, there are different shapes and sizes and maybe slightly different colors, but they're essentially the same thing. It's a, a solar PV panel, a photovoltaic. Um, and what that does is it produces electricity. First of all, it produces direct current. We then convert that to alternating current uh, through a, an inverter. And we can use it, <clears throat> as you can see there, uh, for hot water. You can run your appliances. You can run your heat pump, your TV, your washing machine, charge batteries, etc. cetera. So uh, alternatively, you have something we don't see an awful lot of today, solar thermals. So these are the old flat panels looking something similar to this, but they were typically kind of totally black. They didn't have that little white pattern running through it or the lines. These produce hot water. So the water ran through it, and like any hot body, like the bonnet of your car on a hot day, if it was sunny, uh, the water got heated up, and as it passed down into your hot water cylinder, of course, it gathered heat over time. That was its purpose. Uh, we won't be talking about it today. The reason is it's typically around the same price as solar photovoltaic, uh, but it's limited by comparison. 10 years ago, uh, it was probably the best of what was there because it was uh, typically much cheaper than photovoltaic at the time, um, but now it's it's not. And um, the PV 
probably has kind of three or four times the savings typically. Anyway, lastly, we have solar thermodynamic panels. These are panels that you sometimes see in roof. It's, it's essentially a heat pump. It's a piece of refrigeration kit. The panel sits on the roof facing the sun. As the sun hits it, uh, the compressor essentially refrigerates the panel. We don't need to possibly go into it, but it's a more efficient solar thermal system. But again, it can only produce hot water. Now, it could also run a swimming, swimming pool or something like that, but sure how many houses have them. Um, again, an efficient piece of kit, but not really for housing, right? So um, what we're going to be covering today uh, is solar photovoltaic PV. So how do PV panels work? Without going into the, the real uh, physics of this, we're going to say that when the photons of solar light hit the panel, we get an, an effect here, which is the creation of a direct current. So the same type of power that comes off a battery, um, a battery of your car or a battery that you put into whatever battery in your phone is producing direct current. Oh, apologies, apologies, guys. Um, so, yeah, direct current. Uh, it passes through this thing called an inverter. What that inverter does, as I said, is it converts um, electricity from uh, DC to AC, which is what comes out of the sockets in your house or what runs your television or your heat pump or anything else. So um, that's very simplistic. Um, so it converts it to AC. And at that point, you either use it or you export it back onto the grid. So <clears throat> we jump forward here and I'll explain maybe a little bit about the uh, the various components that you might see in a house. So you would have your solar panels on the roof. Typically they're facing south, sometimes not quite south. And in some cases where the end of the house or the gable of the house is facing south, we might have what's known as an east-west system. And we can talk a little bit about that as we go. But um, uh, typically facing some form of south. Um, from that, we get this cable. Now that cable looks like it's running down the roof. Now this is just for diagrammatic purposes, but that cable typically penetrates straight into the attic. And at that point, within one and a half meters of entering the attic, you have to install what's known as a fireman switch. What that fireman switch does is a very important piece of equipment and it's, uh, it's heavily regulated. The reason for it is that if there's a fire in your house and the fireman comes in, the first thing he'll do is he'll kill the power um, at the you know at your meter box so that when he goes in and starts spraying water or if he's going chopping down doors or anything else that he's not meeting a live wire uh, and killing himself so once they turn off the power at the road you uh, it immediately kills the solar panels that's fair it's uh, to 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 it's totally for health and safety so that's the fireman switch I'll show you photos of it in a second so that is in the attic within 1.5 meters of entering the house. That's the, the regulation. So in this case, it looks like it's just running straight down. In this case, it's not showing a battery. I'll show you some of those in a minute. So it comes down and before it becomes usable, it goes through this thing called an inverter. So the inverter, as it says here, apologies, uh, converts DC electricity to AC power. So um, <clears throat> that then uh, can go I'm going to run it straight through here in AC and it goes into my what we call our fuse board or our consumer board and that then divides it. That's typically inside in your utility room, by the way, more, more often than not. And anything that is then connected to that gets power. So I'm putting, there's two forms or there's two electricity feeds coming into this now. There's solar and there's mains electricity. That's no problem. And if, for example, the solar is producing one kilowatt now and I'm using one kilowatt, well, that's fine. The solar produces it. If I'm producing one kilowatt now and I'm using two or three, well, then the mains electricity makes up the deficit. And if it's the other way around, if I'm producing, I'm going to say three or four kilowatts from the solar, but I'm only using one, well, now I have a surplus. If I have a battery, I can store that surplus in the battery and we can also store it in the hot water cylinder if we want to. If we have a surplus, we can decide I'm going to bump the hot water cylinder up a few degrees more rather than exporting the electricity and getting paid. We'll talk about that after. How much you get paid is typically a significantly uh, lower rate than what you would import it at. So 
if you were importing electricity, you might be paying, I'm just going to say 40 cent, whereas if you were exporting it and getting paid, you'd only get 20 cent. So we don't want to export unless we really have to. So is there anything else here? Uh, you have a smart meter, um, which is what measures incoming electricity in kilowatt hours and also what I export. And at the end of the month or at the end of the two month period, one is subtracted from the other. Um, or it's not strictly speaking subtracted from the other, but you, you essentially get credit for anything you export and you get paid your 15 or 18 or 20 cents depending on your provider. So that's kind of the large uh, components. I'm going to keep going and talk a little bit unless there's questions. I mean, none here that I can see at this moment. Um, <clears throat> I keep going. So if we were looking at, uh, again, this is for retrofit housing today, uh, we're talking about um, so where would we start? So typically people call us to say, could you look at our house? What we ask them for, if at all possible, is uh, the electricity bills. Now, the reason for this is, um, you know, people say their bills are high or whatever it is, but quite often that might be, you know, kind of emotional. You know, there might be a lot of science behind that. So we like to see the bills to see what they are. And um, <clears throat> what we do that with that then is, it gives us an image of the house like this. So we can see in January here, the rate is what the house is consuming. So we, we will see that in kilowatt hours, or it's in megawatt hours here, but it doesn't matter, same thing, kilowatt hours. And it's X hundred or X thousand. February, we'd expect to see it dropping a bit, March similarly, and so on. And we get this sort of a dip in the summer, and then it increases again uh, in November, December. That's quite natural. We'll have more lights on. We're typically at home or maybe watching the television more. We might be cooking more. We'd be eating maybe less salads. We would be drying clothes more. We're not hanging clothes out. Uh, so we're using the tumble dryer more. If you have a, a heat pump, you would be running it more in the cold weather. So that's quite natural that the winter months uh, require more electricity than summer. Sadly, <laughs> the solar is kind of the opposite. So you can see here in January what the, the green dot or the green bar is producing here. So you get a typical kind of bell curve where it peaks in summer and it drops again towards winter. There's nothing we can do about this, no matter how much you want to give out to us, we can change the astrophysics uh, scenario where the sun is further away in winter and at a different angle, we can do nothing about this. What we try to do is choose a panel or choose a panel array that will save you over 12 months, roughly 50%. Some people will want it to be 80 or 90% or every now and then we get somebody saying, I want it to be 100%. The problem with that is you end up paying 10 times more for your panels to save, you know, uh, maybe an additional four or 500 euro. So you could be adding 50 or 60,000 to save 50 euro or save uh, maybe 500 euro or something like that. It becomes inordinately expensive. So what we would say to people at that point is, just calm down. We have to be sensible here. I mean, when the sun isn't shining, there's no solar. No, if I covered the whole of Munster, or Ireland, and the, there's, there's no solar. So I need enormous batteries. And sometimes that's simply not economically feasible. So anyway, so you can see there's a bit of science here. Quite often, I would have to say people do not give us uh, the bills. They don't have them. They can't find them or whatever it is. So then we take, we ask them a few questions. Do you have a heat pump? Yes or no. Do you have electric vehicles? Yes or no. Uh, the tumble dryer is probably the big one and a few other questions and very uh, how many people are in the house and all the rest what types of showers do you have so we can very we take an educated guess at that point as to roughly what the energy consumption is it might be four and a half thousand kilowatt hours it might be five five and a half thousand that's typical now if the house is i'm going to say ten thousand square feet that's not a typical house well then we you know we have to do a few more calculations so that's the first thing. What does your yearly profile look like? The next thing we want to look at is <clears throat> your daily profile. So in my case, Shane gets up, uh, or sorry, I'm going to start here with maybe say my parents. So this is a, a kind of a uh, an, an office type profile. The, in the morning at eight or nine o'clock, the energy usage jumps and it stays there all day. And it's this, you know, five o'clock or six o'clock in the evening, the energy tapers off. That'd be kind of a typical office maybe it might also be say my parents who are retired that kind of energy profile in general so and of course that happens to coincide with the production of solar energy the sun comes up again eight or nine o'clock 
and starts producing all day, hopefully, depending on the weather. So, but by contrast, Shane is an example, he gets up, goes to work at six or seven o'clock, and he's not there all day. So there isn't much energy being used during the day when solar is at its peak. And when uh, solar starts to dissipate in the evening, Shane comes home and starts using energy again. Why is this important? Well, in the second case, if Shane has solar panels and he's not there during the day to use the energy, well, he either has to export it, in which case he's only getting paid 15 or 20 cents for it, or he needs a battery, right? Go back to the single peak profile where my parents, as an example, are there all day or our office where, you know, there's bodies all day with computers, lights, um, heating or air conditioning or whatever it is. Well, they're able to use it as it's being produced. So there's a strong argument in that case that I should not have a battery. Now, the software ultimately tells us if we want to do a very uh, in-depth analysis of this. But so there are the two things we want to look at. Your 12 month profile. Does. Uh, solar suit and then look at a 24 hour profile to see how do we actually now that we're into the detail do we need batteries what types of uh, inverters do we want etc just to give you an example of a 12 month profile where we solar might not suit um, something like uh, in farming this time of year uh, half of the country will have cows calving and they'll want to heat milk in january or february and because their bill for that month might be two or five thousand or whatever it is. Well, I can straight away tell them that's probably not a great investment because it's the heaviest month of the year or two months of the year. And it's the worst solar months of the year. Maybe this, you know, uh, your typical sales guy will possibly sell it to you thinking that over the year you'll save X. But you actually want it in January or February. And then, you know, unless you have the biggest battery on the planet, you can't store the energy from June and July until the next January. So that just gives you an idea of what we're trying to uh, do as we analyze your project. So, uh, again, this is just an example of a project in Limerick. Um, it's, uh, we did this house probably. 12 or 14 years ago. Recently, Joe decided he wanted a heat pump, no problem, or sorry, solar panels. And um, we look at his bills. We decide then on the solar panels, we put in maybe 10. How, how does that do? 12, 14. And we can see as we change it, the cost going up and also the savings. And then eventually after uh, whoever it is looks at their three or four options, uh, they can decide, well, this is what I want to do now. And again, the software tells us whether a battery is a good or a bad decision. In this case, uh, it's a quite a large house. It has a heat pump. It has two electric vehicles and both father and uh, uh, mother both work from home. So they're able to use all of it. So the science tells us in this case that a battery over a 25 year period actually doesn't save them an awful lot. So uh, now, in this case, I have to say also <laughs> they still wanted it, but at least we've armed them with the scientific analysis and um, they can make their decision based on that. But uh, this is a big system. It's a 22 panel system with somewhere around probably 15,000. But again, two electric vehicles, uh, heat pump and a large house. So what the software does for us is uh, if we get your air code, you, so that tells us essentially your position on the island of Ireland and what we know from that then is uh, we know the amount of solar uh, irradiance that will occur on your roof of your house per year. We know that statistical, it's a 30 year uh, uh, data we use. So we will know that your house is, I'm going to say whatever, in Tarlis, and we know how much energy falls in Tarlis from, from the sun. The next question we need to know is, well, is it facing south or is it orientated southwest? Is it directly east? Is it north? Right. So uh, and so what this picture that you can see here tells us that on the roof of the house facing south here, it's bright yellow. That tells me that there's a lot of energy falling there over the year. You can see that the north facing bit of the roof is, is dark in color. So that tells me, obviously, uh, unsurprisingly, that there's uh, much less energy available there on the front of the house jutting out here. I'm just going to click here. Um, is this is getting uh, this would be east west, but you can see that I'm going to get solar shading here from uh, the chimney. That's no problem. Again, we do this from Google Earth. You give us your air code, we get the house, we pull it straight into the software. All we have to then do is 
uh, it takes the shape of the house from Google Earth. All we have to do is tell us the angle of the roof, typically 33, 35 degrees, whatever it is. Um, but anyway, long story short, um, this particular customer wanted to put it in the garage anyway because he didn't want it on the roof of the house for various reasons. So it was trickier to get the wiring done, etc. And probably some bit of it was aesthetics also. Um, so in this case, I think uh, I could click into this but it'll bring me into the software, but um, um, it gets very elaborate because it generates a 12 or 13 page report for each project. Um, but uh, before I forget it, you can see here where this bit of shading behind the chimney is. This is kind of an accumulation of hours every year where the, where the panels would be shaded by the, by the chimney. In this case, what it is telling me is that if I was putting solar here, there are times when it would be working perfectly, but there are times also when one or two of the panels might be shaded. What we would do in this case is we would use things called optimizers. What an optimizer does is, if you can imagine, uh, I'm just going to say I have five panels, and if they're all producing 400 watts, the sun is shining on them all, and they're all producing 400 watts, that's fine. The system uh, overall is, is working way happily. However, if one of those panels is shaded or partially shaded, I'm just going to say it's 50% shaded and it's taken down to 200 watts, it actually pulls all the others down to 200 watts as well. So in a case like that, what we do with that, op the optimizers actually take that the weakest link, so the one that is shaded because of a tree, because of a chimney, because of a uh, an adjoining building or something like that. If one or two of them are shaded, we would use these optimizers. It removes them as such from the circuit and all the other ones that are performing at a higher level continue performing at a higher level. So uh, anyway, we'll cover that if we, if we were to see it uh, at a particular uh, project. So anything else in this one that I need to look at? So, yeah, so in a case like this, uh, 22 panels uh, off the top of my head, I'm afraid to open, if I click on this, it'll open, but it'll open on my other screen and I won't be able to share it with you. Well, if history is anything to go by, um, I always make a mess of it. So um, the other thing, so these are only snippets out of the, the report. You can see here in megawatt hours what's being produced. Uh, Self-consumption is whatever, 76% in this case, case. So the software will tell us that Joe's house will not consume uh, X percentage and therefore we're going to uh, export this, the the uh, remaining 24%. Um, and then, of course, we can put in uh, the various rates, how much I'm paying for the incoming electricity, how much I'm going to get allowed for the export electricity, and all of that feeds into our uh, payback or our savings analysis. You know, typically with, with um, your normal project, even something that's much uh, more everyday than this house, you'd say that doesn't have the two electric vehicles or the big uh, house or people working from home, etc. Um, we're seeing typically today around five, a five year payback compared to probably three years ago, that was a 10 year payback and 12 years ago, that was a 14 or a 15 year payback. That's for different reasons. Panels have come down enormously in price. At the same time, of course, the installation costs have gone up. We know that. Um, the other thing that's happening at the moment, of course, electricity has gone up probably threefold in the last three years, we'll just say. So all of a sudden, solar now really makes sense. We don't expect that to change very quickly. Over time, we'll expect to see it coming down, but it won't be today or tomorrow. Uh, OK, I'm answering the questions here as I go, guys. So anything you have for me to answer, throw it in, and I'll attach it to the relevant spot. So any other questions there? So in a case like this, um, <clears throat> uh, where the fuse board is in the garage, uh, sorry, where there is a sub board in the garage, that obviously is joined across into the house also. Um, that's no problem. We can put the solar up. It feeds into the fuse board outside. So a small health warning. Sometimes the cable that's going out to the garage might be very small. It might only be suitable for running a few lights or whatever. So I'm just going to say if the cable going out is capable of taking one kilowatt to run a few lights, well, obviously, it's not going to be able to take any, I'm oh, sorry, it might be obvious. It won't take any more than one kilowatt on the way back in either. So if you're putting up 10 kilowatts or six kilowatts on the garage, we need to know that the cable that was there to start with is capable of running it back into the main fuse board. If it's not, it has to be increased in size. Uh, we, we'll advise you of this anyway. 
Secondly, if I do have a battery in this case, I need to get a cable from wherever the inverter is, which is typically in a case like that, it might be in the attic of the garage or you know, maybe downstairs in the garage. I need to get a cable, a CAT5 cable, to either the fuse board to the electricity meter. Now, this is a pain in the butt for some people, but uh, there's a reason for it. Uh, I won't go into it here now today. It's just to do with the with the uh, the in, the system needing to make intelligent decisions depending on what's what is happening. If I have a, a day where it's very sunny and I'm using uh, not much electricity, the battery needs to know whether to discharge or not. Um, and if uh, if anyway, so we leave it at that. So I'm going to keep going. <clears throat> Rough costs. Uh, in or around, the, the, you know, I'd have to say, if you're in Dublin, they're going to be higher than this. Uh, not because we charge you more, but because it's more expensive to get subcontractors there. The work is slower there, traffic, etc. I'm sorry, you won't be happy with me saying that, but it's a sad reality. Um, so uh, you can see there are four kilowatt systems, um, 8,000 to 92. Uh, six kilowatt system with a battery 14 to 14 seven you take the grants away from that uh, in all cases here the grants are 2400 euro so you, so you can subtract that at the moment guys we have uh, in terms of a lead time for solar is probably four to six weeks <clears throat> in some parts of the country that might be slightly slower because our crews might be busier but in general i would say at the moment uh, i would say four or five weeks something like that we have a lot of crews at it and we can turn it around relatively quickly. Um, so the grants, uh, you might or might not know this, the way the grants work is uh, for the first two kilowatts of solar that you install, you'll get 900 euros each. So two, two 900s being 1800. And then for the subsequent kilowatts, you'll get 300 up to a maximum uh, of 2400 euro. So, um, in terms of the feed-in tariffs, in two seconds I checked the time. Okay, we're going okay. So, uh, in terms of feed-in tariffs, it's probably two months or three months since I've checked this, but uh, you probably have to check it your thumbs anyway. SSE are typically giving, or at the time anyway, were uh, giving you or allowing you 14 cent for each kilowatt hour you put out onto the grid uh, that you had a, a surplus, where you had a surplus. Surplus energy were giving 21 cent. Now that looks great by comparison, but keep in mind they're probably also charging you more for any electricity they're selling you. Energia 18, Electric Ireland 14, or gosh 18 and a half, and Flow Gas 20. Um, yeah, okay. So you can see there where we're after getting that. SEI's website will, will uh, corroborate uh, what I've said there. So I'm just going to go into some maybe some examples here and show you some, some uh, projects and uh, just to show you maybe some pointers that you might be looking at, kind of what size are they, what do they look like, um, what size are the panels, etc. So I'll go through these and just uh, show you anything that's of interest as I'm, as I'm happening across it. Um, so these are typical panels, they're 410 watt panels, uh, they're about 1.7 meters high, so that's in uh, old, uh, old language, that's five foot six ish right something like that uh, and they're about they're about three foot wide <coughs> so just over a meter um you can get them bigger and you can get them smaller um the reason for that is we say in, in a roof like this you can see here that there was plenty space available so we you know we didn't have to be too careful about the panels we selected but in some houses here where we might have velux windows and there's three of them on that roof all of a sudden um you know as an example if your velux windows were 1.8 meters apart you can, you can get one panel in there comfortably, but I can't get 1.8 panels. So ideally I would like two smaller panels. Uh, otherwise I just end up with a very disjointed looking uh, solar array and it, it looks messy. So we try to avoid that. Um, so um, give me two seconds. So this is a ground mounted array. <clears throat> uh, this is in Limerick. Uh, I'll show you a closer image here. Um, now, so these are, uh, this hedge is a bit too close for our liking. We know it has to be moved. The customer has agreed to this. It was the only place he could put the array that he wanted. Um, but over time, if this hedge were to grow, uh, we would have solar shade, we would have shading, and um, we um, 
you know, we're losing efficiency. So <clears throat> here's what it looks like uh, on the day it was installed. So you can see there's a pad needed. I don't know if any of you online are in a situation like this where you're going to be going ground mounted, but the panels get attached uh, kind of the same as they would get attached to a domestic roof then, but the, the frame is, as you can see there. Uh, we can talk about that if there's anybody who's in this boat. Uh, this is a typical kind of garage that we spoke about. Uh, this is a clothesline as opposed to cables, <laughs> cables running cross country to get to his house. Uh, again, so um, again, there's plenty, uh, plenty of room here, so not under pressure. Uh, there are minimum criteria here when you're going for an SEI grant that the panels need to be back uh, 300 millimeters from the right hand side of the roof and also the same here and uh, there's something similar at the top it doesn't look like there's much of a gap there but but there is and the same down here um there's various reasons for it you need to be able to get at the roof if you want to do anything obviously um 300 millimeters doesn't sound like an awful lot of maneuvering space but uh but more importantly i suppose it's to do with the wind we know that in certain parts of ireland uh the, the, the wind is an issue uh the bracketry is designed for it uh, but at the same time, if you do have that panel with kind of a, uh, an 80 or 100 mil gap underneath it, you're asking for trouble. If you keep that out to the edge of the roof, the, end will, the wind will whip in underneath it. I keep going. So um, I'll start here with the left hand side. This is everything kind of in one spot. So it's a busy little picture, but um, you can see here the fireman switch. So you can see the cables are coming in here through the, the roof into the fireman switch. There's an isolator on the fireman switch so that uh, for any reason I can kill power to it. So essentially if there's power in my house, there's power going to that which tells it, yeah, everything is okay. The house is not on fire or whatever. Um, and you can continue operating. But the minute that power is killed, that switch stops the solar panels from working and that's that. So uh, I might want to do that as an example you're probably thinking, well, why would you put a switch on it? Well, that switch is there for anybody. If they needed to maintain it or anything else, they can do so safely. So uh, those cables come then down out of that and they go to various places. Well, first thing is there's an isolator. Again, I can switch it off yet again. So this is a solar power coming down in direct current. It comes down into my inverter and that inverter decides then what to do with it. If I'm producing a lot more energy than what I need, it will put it back into the batteries. You can see here, these are two uh, 5.1 kilowatt hour batteries. So I can store 10.2 kilowatt hours. Um, and uh, after that, that inverter is a hybrid inverter. I have to have a hybrid inverter if I want to use batteries, whether now or in the future. Um, now you could, some people will put in a simpler inverter, it's called a string inverter. That's, it's not suitable for a battery, but uh, we wouldn't probably see 20% of people putting in um, the hybrid inverter, even if they are not using a battery, because they might intend to do it in two years or three years, whenever they have a bit of spare cash. So the hybrid inverter is for the battery, string inverter is for a simpler system. It's cheaper also, but not astronomically cheaper. It might be off the top of my head, two or 300 euro. So, uh, and in this case, the inverter is looking to that cable I spoke about a while ago, a cable that is going to the incoming mains, and it's measuring uh, what's happening. So um, it's telling us uh, if the house is consuming any electricity and the inverter then decides, actually, I have power over here. I'm going to discharge the battery. So it's that inverter there with the little computer you see in the front of it is making, it's, it's calling the shots. And so in that case, I need to have visibility to the main incoming line. And then the inverter has, it knows what the house is consuming. It knows what the battery has. It knows what the solar is doing. And it then decides where the energy goes to, comes from and goes to. Um, and then um, you have the connection ultimately down to the fuse board. You have a few other things here. You've got AC isolators. Again, these are just so guys can work on the work on the um, the equipment um, if it needs to be maintained. So what you can see here is that this is mounted in, I'm guessing, somebody's garage or maybe in the upstairs of their house. All of this equipment, especially this inverter, is to be look, uh, either put on, uh, as you can see here, a block wall. Uh, and the reason for this is at times it can, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's really working hard, it can heat up. Obviously you don't want something like that sitting on timber where it could ultimately potentially go on fire if something went wrong. So it has to be on a kind of a fireproof 
uh, wall. Now, and they don't, by the way, but, you know, I suppose best practices just isn't an issue. So um, you can see here it's onto a concrete wall. No problem, that's all above board. This is a string inverter with no batteries. You can see here uh, by comparison, it's a smaller arrangement. You can see here by a kind of a standard block, roughly what we're talking about. So this here is about a foot and a half wide by a foot and a half tall. The hybrid inverter is typically kind of two foot wide by I suppose two foot tall um, and batteries are uh, whatever they are in this case, I'm gonna say two and a half foot by two foot tall. Uh, everybody has feet, so we have to use that measurement. So, <clears throat> okay, so slightly different picture. Uh, these are so far inverters. Uh, now, the only reason that we might use so far here versus Huawei or uh, what we in the last one, we had SAJ, uh, look, it depends. We, we might need, uh, I'm going to say, a, a six kilowatt hybrid inverter, and SAJ mightn't have it. They might have a five and a seven, so we might end up go, going to Huawei or whatever it is. But you know, um, they're typically all good. There are, I suppose, the the likes of Huawei and these guys are certainly and SAJ are certainly kind of the Rolls Royce model. Um, just uh, I should have mentioned by the way on the solar panels, they have a 25 year guarantee. What that means is that in 25 years time. Uh, these panels are guaranteed to be putting out 86% of what they did day one. So yes, there's a bit of degradation, but they're guaranteeing that in 25 years time, you won't have any more than 14% of drop off. We include that in our calculation. So if we run that, um, that calculation we did while ago, that analysis, we do show that uh, degradation and it's reflected in our figures. So we keep going. Here's another one. <clears throat> I just threw this one. That's a six kilowatt hybrid inverter. So there is a battery here. And I just showed this picture because you can see here that the battery is mounted on a piece of timber and the inverter is mounted on a, a fire rated uh, plasterboard. Now, and the reason for that again is, uh, is uh, potentially heating at the back of this. You, it's a bad photo maybe for it, but you can see here that there are fins and in operation, those fins would dissipate maybe excess heat from the inverter. So, um, that's it. By the way, in, when it's in operation, that a plastic <laughs> poly pocket like that sh should not be left sitting there. Um, again, you have the fireman switch and you have your other isolators. So I would say that's kind of nearly a typical uh, installation, maybe. Uh, you can, uh, we do get asked uh, regularly about <clears throat> if that was in a kid's bedroom or something upstairs, well, can I cover it in? You can cover it in in the same way that you cover in and maybe a radiator if you didn't like it, you could just get a radiator cover, um, but there is a ventilation requirement. Um, you, the, the, this unit will operate happily up to about 50 degrees. Now, if it's 50 degrees in the bedroom, there's something gone massively wrong anyway. However, if I did put a tiny cover around this and insulated it, it could easily reach 50 degrees. In that case, the inverter stops working and so does the battery. Now, there's nothing catastrophic going to happen. It just won't be saving you money. So if we're seeing somebody, there's no noise off of these, by the way. So if something like this is going into an upstairs office or something, we would put that kind of a radiator type cover over it. Air can get in the bottom, air can get out the top. Everything works away happily. So in two seconds, I'll check a few questions coming through here. Okay. Why was a battery not recommended where there are two EVs? I don't know if this is a particular question. Um, you, you certainly can use a battery. Um, oh, sorry, this is to do with Joe's house there. Um, your, your, your battery here, just to put it in context, uh, is something like a Tesla car, the batteries are 70 kilowatt hours, right? And your battery, your typical battery is five. If you have two cars, that's 140 kilowatt hours. And again, your, your battery is, is five. So, you know, you're better off just putting that energy straight into the cars than into the battery. Because even if the cars were gone all day and I charge up the battery, when the cars come home, I plug them in, I'm sure it, you know, it has dissipated its charge in, you know, minutes. Um, that, that's what this, I, I, I think in that case, the cars are at home. So the cars become the battery, um, you know, why would you be paying for more batteries if I have two cars and I'm working from home anyway, normally? So, sorry, that's one question. Um, do you use 420 watt panels? 
uh, what make do you use, uh, what app do you use? So I'm probably the last man in the company to answer the last question for you. Uh, but we, we, we have panels from everything from 395 watt up to probably 420 watt. And it depends on the shape that we need. Sometimes uh, people want a very particular uh, look of panel, maybe extremely black, um, in which case, or on the ground mounted one there is an example, they're 415 watt, sorry, 410 watt panels because of the way they're orientated and they have to uh, fix onto the brackets. So we have different sizes and types. It depends what the customer wants. It depends what will fit. It depends on the mounting, orientation and methodology, et cetera. Um, what panels do we use? We typically use Jinko. Uh, anything, again, you can use Huawei or you can use whatever. Um, at the moment, they're easiest to probably to get. They're one of the biggest, sorry, if they're not the biggest manufacturer in the world. Again, they have a 25 year guarantee. Um, and uh, by the way, any panels that you see at the moment going to Ireland, they have to be what's known as a tier one panel. So this means, um, you know, there's a worldwide kind of a rating system. Um, and if it's not tier one, you cannot get grants. This is a good thing to know because at least, and yes, there are, you can have excellent panels and you could have good panels, but you can't have rubbish panels and get a grant. You simply, the, the government won't give, won't give you the grant. So that's good. Uh, the app that we use, I actually can't answer you that. Um, I would have to get one of the geeks here, but typically the app will come with the inverter. Um, I know that in other cases you have a, a central app which talks to maybe the heat pump, talks to the solar, can talk to the ventilation or can do, 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 uh, work with the home energy automation. I know we're dealing with lots of different uh, types of apps. I'm the wrong man. Sorry. Uh, if you want to drop us a message, I can certainly get one of our uh, gurus here to go uh, to, uh, to answer your email and give you more information. So uh, I'll take the opportunity while I'm on this slide here to maybe draw your actually I'll go on a slide and um, show you how we let's close that fill up. Go on a slide. So <clears throat> I'll show you how you fix uh, the panels to the roof. Some of you would be interested in it, maybe. So this is a typical slate roof. Uh, we have to take out a few uh, slates, and then we uh, notch this one. We, you fix your, your bracket uh, onto your, uh, your rafter there. So uh, once that's done, you put back up the other uh, slates, and you end up with a scenario like this, where you have um, a little... Uh, flashing that goes up under the slates, it kind of goes up a foot or a foot and a half <coughs> under the other slates above here, and you end up with something that looks like this. Now, that bracket is going up there. What you don't see there actually is that there's a, a kind of a, a foam, a piece of foam that wraps around that bracket and slides up to prevent any rain being blown up there. So, um, you know, that's a very successful methodology compared to what we were using possibly 20 years ago or 18 years ago. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was every man for himself and trying to kind of stop water getting in. And, uh, you know, silicon was every installer's best friend back then. Whereas today, if you look at here and you can use this as well for slate, uh, this is a, a flashing or a, a kind of a, for all the world, a tile that is uh, made from aluminium. It's about, uh, I'm going to say, two foot long. It comes in various lengths, but that slots right up under the other tiles here so that any rain that falls in between those two tiles falls in underneath onto the flashing. So the water gets directed down and that flashing then is uh, molded such that uh, it's, it's, there's a little bump up. You can see that. So, but there's no, there's no weld or a seam here. That's just it's pushed up same as maybe you'd make a, a metal plate or something like that. It's formed in that. And then you have a, an EPDM rubber uh, going around that. And then you essentially have the bolt going down through the whole lot and again down into the down into the rafter, right? So, you know, that's a bulletproof methodology for fixing onto the roof. Again, 20 years ago, this was a bolt with some sort of a rubber washer, hopefully making a clean seal to the roof. Um, so um you know th these things today are bulletproof anyway so a lot of people have questions there once i have that bolt sticking up or a bracket like this i can fix these rails so you can see the rails here they get bolted on now they're in uh, these brackets by the way are typically stainless 
these rails that you see in this case <clears throat> are typically uh, aluminium. Uh, it's lightweight, uh, it's corrosion resistant, it's uh, an anodized aluminium, so you, you're not getting corrosion there. Any of the components that are used on the roof are uh, typically stainless steel or some form of uh, material that is uh, rust resistant. Um, so um, anyway, so once I have these rails on, you can see here then, so I've uh, obviously there's, uh, depending where you are, if you're in really windy locations, you need more of these brackets because there's just more wind loading. Um, and once I have these rail, I can then attach onto the rail, I can drop the panel and round every panel, then I have these brackets and that's just tightened up. So um, I'm just gonna go back a slide here. <clears throat> I can. Can't by the looks of it. Okay, so that's slate. And yeah, so that brings us the same thing. Um, is there anything there I wanted to show you? No, it's covering all the same thing. Find dirty boots up on the roof that day, obviously it had been raining, and or it's a new site, maybe potentially where they're just uh muddy. Okay, so I keep going. By the way, <clears throat> this looks like a flat. Uh, tile here, but it, it's uh, it's really no different for an uh, we'd say what we would call a kind of a, a corrugated type tile. Um, your brackets go up something similar to this fella. So you take you pop off a few tiles. You have to groove the inside of the tile. So if you can imagine that this bracket, the fella here in the bottom right, is sliding up under a tile, and that bracket is four or five millimeters thick. I don't want the tile to be lifting both by four or five minutes. So we take an angle grind and we just grind it down so that that bracket, that allows the tile to sit down flat. But it, it, actually with, with that type of tile, it's a very simple process. In most cases, the tiles pop off. Um, you know, maybe one in every six tiles is nailed. Mostly they're not. It's just their weight holds them down. And so anyway, that, that's a, that's our dream job if we get to those. Um, again, um, yeah, and, and there's no issue. We would never see water going up uh, underneath. We'd say in a case like like this, even if it was a corrugated tile, where the water goes up. Um, if for any reason we think that uh, we will have an issue with that, we would actually, in that case, use a bit of silicone. It's a very tiny gap that might be left, if any, when we put that bracket up. Okay, so. <clears throat> um, people are asking always if um, they're not facing south. Uh, so we're going to say here somebody is facing um, southeast. Um, so what we asked them is, uh, okay, number one, we asked them where they are in Ireland. We presume we're talking about Ireland for today. Um, we know how much energy is going to fall there. And then if, if it's directly south facing and if it's roughly kind of 30 to 40 degrees, so that's the angle of inclination. So what angle is my roof at? You can imagine if my my solar panel was lying down flat and the sun is kind of hitting it at an angle, you can imagine that there's, that it's not as efficient as if it was facing directly uh, the sun. So uh, you can see here that if it's south facing and if it's from kind of 20 degrees to 40, 40 degrees or 50 degrees, you can see that I'm roughly in the 90 to 100% range. If I were to go away to southeast, I'm just going to go east just maybe to make it as bad as possible. If I was east facing, and if I was at uh, 30 degrees, which most roofs would be, right? So now, now at that point, I'm in the yellow bracket facing in maybe to this other color, whatever that is, maybe slightly uh, cream. Um, I'm in 85 to maybe 90. So what I would say then is that if I put up 10 solar panels, I know that the panels are going to give me 378, 70 or 80 kilowatt hours per year. We just say take 370, multiply that by 10 panels. So that's 3,700 kilowatt hours per year. And I know that if I'm east facing at 30 degrees, I'm just going to say at 80%, I would very quickly multiply my 3,700 by 0.8 and it would tell me the amount of kilowatt hours. Now, it still wouldn't tell me if I'm using them all myself. If I'm using them all myself, I'd be saving we we'll say the 40 cents that I would otherwise have paid for it. If I was exporting it all, I would only be getting the 15 or 20 cent. So then we have to try and take an educated guess. Well, how much will I export? How much will I self-consume? That depends on your lifestyle. Number one, the 12 month 
profiles that we looked at and also the 24 hour profile. Um, so that's what that is. But, um, you know, in our heads, you know, before you start looking at this scientifically, you would easily think that east, you know, as compared to directly south would be a catastrophic drop off in efficiency. But of course, it's not. It's only kind of 15 percent there. So um, anyway, we only use that as a visual. Mostly it's our software does the work for us. Now, there is a uh, pe some people like that project we looked at there with the two EVs and the heat pumps and all the rest of it. That does need that sort of analysis. There is a long lead time at that at the moment because you know we've a lot of commercial projects or agricultural or pharmaceutical projects, and they all take a lot of time. Domestic doesn't, but there's a lot of them going on. So it tends to hold people up. Most people are happy to look at something like this and say, "Yeah, I'm going to get three and a half thousand kilowatt hours or six thousand kilowatt hours or whatever it is," and that'll uh, that does most people. Other people want all the detail. <clears throat> no problem. Only there's a delay with it. So keep going. How long does a typical uh, 5.1 kilowatt hour battery last? Um, so this is just a simple look uh, because most people don't know, like uh, we, we kind of in our heads know that we shouldn't be switching on the electric immersion. It's been beaten into us in Ireland for the last 50 years, um, but we don't actually know what it means. So just to put some context around it. So an electric shower when it's running will draw 8,000 watts. By comparison, an LED light will draw three watts. Okay. No genius. You don't need to be a genius to understand what that means. LEDs are significantly lighter. Uh, and will uh, if I have my battery sitting there with power on it, I can run the lights for significantly longer than I can run an electric shower. But anyway, so just to help you out with these questions. So if I had uh, 8,000 watt shower, I typically a shower in Ireland is seven, seven minutes. That's just statistically speaking, obviously some would be shorter and some would be longer. Uh, so if I have seven minutes of 8,000 watts, that's 0.93 kilowatt hours. So I could theoretically have five showers, right? If, I, if my heat pump was running at the same time and it's consuming 2,000 watts, I could run it for two and a half hours. Tumble dryer, I can run it for 1.7 hours. EV charger, you know, I can charge the car at a certain rate, typically kind of uh, probably the upper side of that is maybe seven or 10 kilowatt to kilowatts. So, you know, less than an hour out of the battery empties. That's just because the battery in the car is so huge. Low heater is two, 2,000 watts. Kettle, you know, it's big, but it's only running for five minutes. So I could actually charge the kettle 12 times from my full battery, right? So uh, the dishwasher is whatever, 1,350 watts. Fridge, uh, TV, 130 watts is probably the outside of that. You can see here LEDs and phone charger. What does this tell me? I suppose it gives me some indication of what 5.1 kilowatt hours, you know, because I know most people don't know what a kilowatt is. And then when you throw in the H, what's a kilowatt? What's the difference between a kilowatt and a kilowatt hour? Sure, I don't know. Well, I do know, but most people don't. So what this would tell a person is that if my power went down for whatever reason, uh, and I want to use the battery and I have the various equipment for using the battery uh, in that situation, I have to isolate from the grid <clears throat> uh, so that I'm not producing power and sending power out the grid at that particular moment because there's a fellow outside in the road trying to fix the cable and all of a sudden there's 230 volts coming at him and he's dead. So we have to isolate uh, or go into what we call island mode. Uh, but once if I do or once I do, I can then say, right, I have 1700 hours of running my LED light or I have 1.7 hours of running my tumble dryer. So uh, what we would do in this case is we would turn off certainly the tumble dryer, we cut down on the electric showers. Uh, you could work away with the kettle knowing that well, provided I don't act the clown, I, I can have a cup of tea or coffee. But the dishwasher, you turn off the tumble dryer, as I say, and that's just an indication, right? So furthermore, I suppose an electric vehicle, <clears throat> I hear every now and then about people saying, sure, you know, between the the benefit in kind and the various other things. Uh, maybe the incentives for electric vehicles are now gone and it's as, uh, it's as expensive as a petrol or diesel car. And that's simply not true. Uh, I've taken this information from SAI's website. A typical car, uh, unless it's a, a, a Jeep or something like that, or provided I'm not driving it at 100 miles an hour, a typical car will do uh, 100 kilometers for 15 kilowatt hours. And, you know, over the year, your average, uh, again, this is from SEI, 
uh, average mileage. Now, this might be an average between Dublin and some of the country, but is um, uh, 15,000 kilometers per year. So that's 2,250 kilowatt hours per annum. And I, I, you know, an electric car in this at, at two euro will cost 1,500 euro. Whereas if I was using electricity all at day rate, that's 900 euro. So that's all at 40 cent. So that's today's rate, let's say, kind of at its worst. So straight away at 600 euro cheaper. If I was to use all night rate, uh, which is about 20 cent, I'm uh, jumping ahead, it's at 450 euro. So now it's a full thousand euro cheaper. So I know it's unrelated a little bit to the solar, but just to say electric cars, <clears throat> number one, you can add to the solar because the battery can become the solar battery, right? We just need to program it accordingly. But electric cars, by, I know there's other arguments with the electric cars. I'm not selling them. I don't really care, but I, I just wanted to give the other side of the argument for some of the kind of the silly talk I hear in the pub, you know? So uh, solar panels, I've given you the size 1763, typically by 1040. You know, there are different ones of different sizes. There's a, an inverter. Um, and we've gone through this. So what I would like to say, as we just come up to the one hour mark, um, we do get projects all the time which, where people come looking for solar. Um, and that's fine. No problem. We're doing a lot of it. Um, but what we're trying to, uh, I suppose, make sure is that they're not leaving other grants after them. This is an example of a house that, uh, or two houses of half an estate, that uh, where, where people came expecting that solar was the answer for them. And we straight away asked, okay, were you considering doing any other works? Now, maybe you're in the next year or two. Because when you start bundling these uh, upgrades together, you start unlocking these bonus payments from SEAI. Um, and I'll just, I'll give you the example first and then I'll tell you what the bonuses were. So these people wanted solar, it would have been somewhere in around 7,000. The house was built in 2003, so the attic insulation was okay. There would have been 100, 100 mil of it. The spec today would be 300 mil. So they got the attics insulated for free, essentially, because it was 15, uh, 1300 euro, but that's all it costs. The walls were pumped. They got, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 1700 euro for pumping the walls, but it would have cost probably around that, maybe a few quid with it. Um, but because they're doing insulation and solar, and in, as it turns out, and also heat pump, they get 2,000, well, sorry, they get 1,600 in this case for project management, right? They get 2,000 of an additional bonus for the heat pump because uh, they're doing kind of a full house upgrade. They also get 2,000 euros to upgrade the radiators because they might not be suitable for the heat pump. Long story short, by the time, I, and of course they got the solar grants, but by the time I bundled the individual grants, Along with the bonus grants, uh, we did attic insulation, cavity wall insulation, air to water, heat pump, and we put up solar PV. We couldn't fit an awful lot of it here on the roof because of the way the front of the house is jutting out. Um, but in this case, the total cost was 8,106 euro. So any of you who are already looking at solar kind of in earnest, just make sure that your house is not suitable for all these other grants. As I say, the solar would have been seven grand. They got all of this work done for eight one. I'm not trying, by the way, we don't do insulation. We just subcontract it. So I'm not, uh, no real interest in selling it. All I'm saying is that you could be leaving a whole pile of grants after you. And the next time, if you were considering you wanted to get them, you might have taken a step too far by putting in maybe a heat pump or solar panels under a Better Energy Homes grant. And you've now kind of forfeited your right to go into a one-stop shop or a BEC in the future. Just highlighting it you know, to yourself what you want to do. But <clears throat> they jumped there from a C2 to an A3 for 8,000 euro. So it would have been seven. So I'm at the end of that, guys. I have no other questions that I haven't covered as we went through. Um, so, and it is two o'clock on the button. So for the first time in history, I've managed to stick to the hour. Um, and I'd like to thank you. If you have any questions, throw them in to us. Um, most of you probably are already dealing with us in some shape or form. And, and I'd like, like to thank you for your time. By the way, we do ongoing uh, seminars. We do the, as I just said there, the BEC or the One Stop Shop webinars. We do them every Tuesday. So yesterday evening at six o'clock and every Thursday at lunchtime. And we also do a 
kind of a two and a half or a three hour chat once a month. Uh, and that's, uh, you can find that on our website, ashgrove.ie. So um, the, um, the, that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you for your time. Um, be sure to make contact with us if, uh, if you need anything further. Take care, bye.